There we are with another episode of the Corporate Elephant. And today's elephant is talent blindness. And I have Heiner with me from all the way from Mexico, who is working in recruitment and who is the best person to talk about talent and talent blindness if it's not a recruiter, right? (laughs) Yeah, introduce yourself and what you do. So they know. Well, thank you so much, Sylvia, for inviting me to this talk. It's really a pleasure, you know, especially as I'm kind of like uh, like like to talk with people and connect with people internationally. You in Dubai, me in Mexico. That's so really great. So what what I've been doing for the past uh, almost 17 years already? Well, I, I source talent. You know, I mm-hmm. research and source talent for companies, for uh, hospitality companies. You know, like. Um, it's not like a traditional headhunter. You know, my clients, they ask me, listen, we need a very specific profile. I need you to source and uh, find options for us, you know. And mm-hmm. that's, that's what I do, you know. Uh, usually, I mean, most of the time, these are profiles they cannot find through conventional uh, means, you know, in the internet mm-hmm. and everything like that, right? So okay. I got my ways of turning around each stone and finding my way through the uh, jungle, talent jungle, and, uh, you know, filter filter professionals according to the expectations of our clients. Yeah. Yeah, very important. And I would like to kick off with a subject that I have noticed in the past few years. So Um, employees, those are who are looking for jobs, they say there are no jobs. Employers who are looking for people, they say there are no talent. Everybody's okay. looking for each other, but we are not finding. What went wrong? What is wrong? Do we really have talent blindness? Can't we just see the forest from the tree? Yes, yes, we do. I agree with you. We do. You know, I mean, because of the internet, every everybody kind of like conf- trusts the internet to do the job. But it doesn't. You know, when you, we are not like televisions or we are not like microwaves. We are human beings. And this is a very, very individual focused business. This is just my opinion. Okay? Mm-hmm. This is a very individual business. You know, if, uh, for example, uh, companies, most of the times, they, they are very passive in searching uh, the talent that they are looking for. They kind of like uh, just post and pray. You know, I, I just put it up there on a thousand web pages and see what comes in. They're wasting so much time, and especially the talents they are looking for or they would like to talk to, do not react to this. You have to be very proactive and, and, uh, and find these people and start building a little confidence because before you, uh, you, know, you, you, you offer them an interview process. You know, mm-hmm. you have to build trust. You have to build confidence before you start uh, offering them an, 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 an interview process. So it's you know it's a, it's hard work. It takes time. It doesn't go from one day to another. And having a great, incredible network helps because uh, then you know where to look or in what directions. Yeah. So we, that's pretty my comment to the uh, talent blindness. Now. With the talent, it's the same thing. People that are searching, they again, they trust too much on all these ads on the internet. You know, they are basically their application mm. is managed by algorithms, right? Although they are great talents, they're great people, a perfect fit for the job. If they have one degree missing or half a year experience missing, the algorithm doesn't put them through. You know mm. what I mean? And that's yes. a mistake. So that's why I always say, uh, especially in, in uh, middle and high management, this is a very individual business. You have to approach people individually. All right. Mm. I won't talk too much. So it's just, that's my yeah. I take on. I agree. I agree with that. And people are missing out on opportunities, right? And you know, when I realized what real recruitment should look like, and that we have talent blindness, we don't see talent. Well, this is my job to spot talent, to see the talent in individuals. But, um, and we talked about it last time, that when 
an Irish recruiter got my CV a few years ago from somewhere and he contacted me. And I'm like, okay, let's have a chat. You know, I'm not too keen on recruitment and interviews and all that because just all the bad experiences. And I had a conversation with this guy and he goes through my CV. He doesn't really ask any questions. You know, it's just a normal chit chat. He didn't ask me, why did you leave this job? Why did you move here? Why, 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 why? The normal questions. And he says, Okay, so let's summarize your experiences. You have done food and beverage in the hotel. You have done front office. You have done housekeeping, managing large teams. You understand the financial aspects of the of a department. Um, and you understand all that kind of things. Um, you just disappeared. Oh, really? I can see you. I can see you. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's great. So you understand all the kind of things. And so, and you have done millions of hotel openings. So you would make a really good number two in a hotel. And I'm like, I never looked at myself this way, you know? And this is when I understood what talent or what recruiters, uh, recruitment should look like. And what an interview should look like. So for me, this guy raised the bar so high. I cannot actually, since then, I haven't had that kind of conversation. Yeah. Uh, you, know, it's, uh, you know, I completely understand you and this guy. Really, really, really good uh, talk. He wants to connect with you, you know. I mean, there are like uh, a million executive chefs out there, a million financial controllers and a million GMs and everything. But they're so individual, so different, they experience, like you experience, you know, this guy recognized, listen, I got clients that look for profits like you, they have a philosophy that look like people like you that are, that just, you know, you fit into the mold perfectly, you know what I mean? And this guy recognized, recognized your strengths without you telling them. He just looks at your CV, which you well explained, not too much, but bullet points, you know, the, the important stuff. And he recognized, listen, if I would be GM, I would hire her as my second. Now this guy, the recruiter, I think it was an, maybe an independent recruiter. Now he just has to find within his clients, somebody, somebody who recognizes the same thing and looks for the same things. You know, a lot of times uh, uh, candidates get rejected and they think they're like, other people are better than them. That's not true. Mm. There's no bad talent. There's no. That's just not the right job for a particular person. So I always have to kind of like, uh, you know, I have to uh, let a lot of people, I have to let them down because you're in a recruitment process, only one will be selected, right? Mm. Well, you kind of have to explain it's, them. Listen, yeah? go ahead. No, it's, it's so true that we don't see, and that's why maybe we are the ones who is creating the talent shortage, you know? Because maybe there is no talent source. It's just, just we don't see talent. And I don't know where we've gone wrong with recruitment. What is your experience with, with, with the hotel industry? What is it that we are looking for? <laughs> uh, so, uh, like I said, uh, finding the right people, especially a profile, especially for the key positions, it's not a, it's not a job. A regular hotel recruiter can do. A hotel recruiter, you know, which works as an assistant to a human resource director, I would think, they have a certain, you know, you don't find talents Monday to Friday from 9 to 5 because they're mm. all working. They do not respond. When you find talent, it's on the weekend. And that's yeah. when I find my best talent because then they have time to talk, then they respond to me, and that's when I, uh, when I uh, really, you know, I received some really good leads, you know. So this is a hotel recruiter will not do. A hotel recruiter, I don't know, an F&B director sends his request for his restaurant manager or F&B assistant to the, uh, to the hotel recruiter. The hotel, most of the hotel recruiter, and we know that, they just send them some old CVs, they have on their file, and see if you like somebody. You know, that's the, you know, and the, the, that's what a lot of key directors, uh, Directors tell me, you know, I mean, I'm so they have to be a bit more, it has to be a lot more work and a lot more communication, which is very important. The recruiter 
the hotel recruiter has to call up the department head. Tell me, please, tell me specifically what you look for without closing the umbrella too much. You don't want to close it too much, otherwise, you know, it will be impossible for the recruiter. But, but when I get a request, obviously, I have my little form and, you know, put the budget in there, blah, blah, blah. I, I tell them, give me the number of your department head. I want to talk to him. And then I tell the department, give me your five, three to five main criteria you look for in that hire. What do you look for? You, the three to five most important ones. And that's what I focus on. So that's it. Uh, and a hotel recruiter doesn't really do that, uh, apart from other things, you know? Mm. You have to be proactive. You have to pro go out there. Don't post and pray. Don't check you, you know, maybe you can check your file for leads, to approach, to update them, whatever. But you have to be incredibly, uh, incredibly proactive, you know, especially for the key positions, I mean, you know, so. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I don't see that. I don't see that proactivity, you know. I really do see and I can, I can identify with that because that's all I saw that, you know, we post it post the role, post the position, and that's it. We hope for the best. And whatever comes through that, um, we select from that. But then we are really missing out on, on great people because there are a lot of people, and this is where headhunters come into the picture, right? More about, it's kind of that kind of approach, that a lot of people who are really, really good, they are not even looking for a job. The most of the times they are taken and poached by others. So they, you're never going to come across their CV either. And, no. um, and we, the, the industry is missing out on, uh, out on those yeah. ones. For me, the talent shortage, of course, there are different level of, you know, for the senior roles, you really look for um, a, a different caliber. But we are also missing out on a lot of talent at the mid and the lower uh, level of jobs. Um, yeah. Because... Even there, we could look at and be a little bit more proactive. Now, I understand the numbers, but what I was um, thinking about being proactive, that we don't have a strategy, and I always miss that, you know? When we hire a waiter, or when we hire a supervisor, a manager, do we look at the team that we want to build? Do we look at what is missing from that team and bring that in? Do we look at the strengths, the personality, the male, female ratio? You know, if we could talk about the list is endless. Are we building a team or are we just looking for two hands to put, you know, um, put the plug in? And that's it. Yeah. Plug the hole and it's finished. And that's why sometimes we have very, very good people leaving, coming and going because we did not find or did not hire the right person for that particular team, for that particular manager, you know, who is going to report. And, and I've seen it many, many times. We don't have yeah. this vision. Are we building a team or we just want an individual? Yeah. Well, obviously, um, you've got a very good point there. Obviously, building a team depends very much on the team leader, on the department head, right? And then we come back to what I mentioned before. If you have a department where you would like to have a lot of ex extroverted people, then don't hire introverted people, right? If you have a department where you were, would like to have a lot of uh, uh, mixed uh, female, male, then, then focus on that. And that's what I said. Uh, you know, you are the recruiter. I have to ask the department head, what do you look for? You know, oh, yeah, I want, you know, I want a multicultural department. I want, uh, you know, young people. I want them to do, uh, I want to have a Google kind of environment. Or I want to have a more conservative kind of environment. But obviously, you have there certain basic characteristics you want to have in your department to them. But it doesn't, team building, it doesn't happen mm. by itself. It happens by the person that leads the department. You know, there you have mm. to adjust. It's, it's not a very important point that is so underestimated. It's the typical WhatsApp talk. You know, when you hire some, especially when you hire somebody, the first two or three weeks, they are so important. You really have to put some effort in that person, so spend some time with him, see how he, how he or she feels, you know, and, and uh, see if she has any doubts, train her, her him, and then after two or three weeks, you can let them go. But if you just throw them in there, like many, many uh, managers do, 
you know, they don't have a chance. They do not yeah. have a chance. They adjust to themselves. They do the they do their things according to their criteria, and that will only lead to failure, in my my opinion. You know, so team building obviously is very important. Yeah. You have to see. You have to know what kind of team you want. You have to have options to choose what you want. Of course, you have to have options. You cannot just oh ten ten fingers, let's go higher. No, no. So uh, and this is this is hard work. And once they're in there, please. Invest some time and effort in your new employee because it will be worth. Because he will be staying for two, three, four years. You know, later on you don't have any work with him, but just uh, or her. So at the begin beginning is very important, in my opinion. Oh yes, onboarding process is the key element of retention, right? Especially during the first first six months. And I like that you said that you know we can look at. I mean, we we, we talk about we can look at the bigger picture. And I give you an example. That also, I think, as a recruiter, we have the responsibility to advise leaders and managers because sometimes they don't know what they want, and no. you know they will tell you, "Oh, I want somebody with an experience. I want you know somebody who already knows the job," and we're missing out on so many talent who who maybe haven't done the job but had difficulties, you know, at mid until the mid level jobs to to learn. But I learned something in the past few years. And I'll give you an example. Um, we have opened a hotel and the restaurant concept was female-led re uh, uh, restaurant. Back of house, kitchen, female-led, lot of women in the kitchen. Yes. Front of house, female-led, lot of women in the, in, in the front of house. Now, everybody said, very nice. And here is what happened. Okay, and it was a massive learning for me as well. Before even we opened that hotel and the restaurant, we already started to have a lot of conflict. Okay, a lot of drama over everything. And I said just two days before the opening to somebody, a senior leader, because it was already, you know, like escalating. We haven't even, you know, four, within four months, it went. Wow. And I said, I didn't even think about it when I said it. I'm like, you're not going to solve this problem as long as you have all that female energy and not balanced out with, with the male energy. Two years, two years on, it's the same problem. It's just arguments, conflicts, crying, shouting, or whatever you want. What a headache. And I truly believe that, if, and I said it many times, I'm like, can we hire a male maitre d' who would, you know, liaise between because the kitchen and the restaurant is fighting. But it doesn't really matter. There is no male leadership in any of those areas, the kitchen and the restaurant. And... And this all-female thing, it just doesn't work out in terms of the chemistry because there's just constant clashes. That is so fun to, 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 to watch. I'm reason? like, sorry? What was the reason to hire, hire an all-female staff? What was the concept or reason? So the, the, the concept is came from, is we wanted to do something differently. And... Okay. Um, and it's just really, I don't think it was a very conscious decision at the very beginning. It's just happened to that the restaurant manager is, you know, female, the head chef is female. And from then onwards, we started building this concept. But to be honest, I, yeah, from, you know, it's a fantastic restaurant, very, very, very busy restaurant, well-functioning restaurant. But in terms of employee engagement, in terms of management, it's the last place I would like to work if I had to work in a restaurant. Wow. It's just too much is going on. So I always urge people to look at what is your gender balance because life is all about balance. And that restaurant showed me that you cannot, you know, ooh, because you're going to end up with something something that you haven't, you know, experienced. I have never experienced that before in my life. And I said oh. that two years ago, 
this is the problem and today is still the same problem and we can't figure yeah. it out it makes sense it makes sense you know just uh, think about a group of friends all female get together in the morning have breakfast five six uh, females and then after they leave everybody is talking not the nicest way about the other one you know so that's just the female dynamic i guess right it is it is it is it is and and you know i'm allowed to say it. this is a female thing and and yes it it is so we need to look at the team really building teams building teams so um in terms of you know the other day i was thinking because i saw a linkedin post i'm like i'm going to ask heiner about that one because we are all very prepared and linkedin is full of this stuff right what you need to say during your interview i'm like oh my god i'm like and and you see that or hear that during interviews because people tell you and i'm like this is written from straight from you know linkedin or you heard it from youtube um but i know i don't see the same amount of information going towards recruiters and why are we not why are we telling people what to prepare and what to say during interviews rather than teaching recruiters how to spot talent apart from asking the silly questions that sometimes they ask i think we also have to switch the balance and and tip the balance over because it's very one sided well well i think each trained recruiter if he's independent or hired they have their own dynamics you know mm -hmm. uh, uh mm, I personally, what I cannot, what's important to me technically, and I cannot see in the CV, I'm asking him in a written interview before I interview him verbally. Because once I interview him, him or her, I'm sorry, verbally, I look for personality. The rest, I'm, the degree, I don't know, you know, but if, like I said, if he left the job after four to five months, I'm going to ask him in a written interview. I want to give him time to tell me why. And if I have doubts, I can, you know, today you can figure this out in minutes on the internet, if it's true or not. I'm not going to ask him this in an interview to make him feel uncomfortable. Why did the company, uh, why did you leave after four months? And he starts, you know, like, no, I, I, don't, I don't want him to be comf comf uh, uncomfortable. I want him to be at ease, as comfortable as possible. And then let him or her talk 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 you don't talk i mean i don't like to talk if it somehow stops talking i say something else so he keeps talking because what i'm looking for in the verbal interview is personality mm. so and so he said ease we, we create a report we create confidence my objective is getting to know the person as much as possible i have his cv i have his written interview i did my research I know if he's married, if, if he travels with kids, if uh, I want to know what's important to him and obviously who he is as a person. So then I can make my, my, uh, can make up my mind if he really fits well into the, the position that I'm looking for, mm -hmm. you know, and there's not, there's nothing better than authenticity. You cannot be an interview person. You're not, you have to be who you are, you know, I mean, if you start you know, not telling the truth or trying to, you have to be authentic. So that's the best chance and opportunity you have to find a job where your personality fits into. And it's going to be a successful job for both the company and the, uh, the candidate. So that's, I always try to push this dynamic. I don't know what you think about this, but this is yeah. my, which I have ex uh, success with, you know? I always go for the truth and authenticity, you know, skills. I'm not so much interested. You can teach anything you really want to teach, but I also look for authenticity. Definitely. You know, and this is why it bothers me. These articles on, on LinkedIn, because they tell you say that, but then I'm not getting the person. I'm like, who is that? I don't want you to say something that you read on the internet. I, you can tell your story. It's your story. Tell me your story. And from that yes. story, right? From that story, I can, you know, gather information and, and kind of paint a picture of who you are. I'd rather have a person telling me that, you know what? I want this job because I need to pay my bills 
Then to create a story, you know, I Googled your companies, the fantastic values, the sustainability program. Nobody cares about it. Okay. This is when people tell me these stories, this is where I shut down and I'm like, maybe at senior level. Yes. Okay. But definitely not line level and mid managers level. They don't care about your sustainability program or your women initiative or whatever that is. Senior level, I would look at it, obviously, how much do you know? What is your way of thinking? And also, you know what I'm missing from recruitment or interviews? Um, that people are not, or recruiters and interviewers, hiring managers, they don't look at how the person thinks. I always look at how somebody thinks, you know, for me, you tell me a story and I don't even hear the story. Sometimes it's just, how did you get to that? You know, what's in your head? And that is more interesting than anything else, but we don't think about it. What we want is literally somebody to say what we want to hear. Perfect match fit. Bye-bye. And that bothers me so much because if I come to you and I tell you, this is what I could do with your company, right? And it doesn't really matter that I can do it or not, because at the moment you are looking at how my brain works and what, 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 what is my, you know, creativity or whatever that is. Am I, am I progressive in my way of thinking? Do I want to create change or I just want to maintain what we already have? And this is where the strategy comes into the picture. Well, who do we want to hire? Do we need to make a change or we need to just maintain what we have? And we don't look at it. And I'm missing that so much, Heine. Listen, Vivia, I just thought about two things that companies are recruiting uh, hotels that are recruiting uh, uh, right now are kind of failing at. Once the follow-up. Mm. Things have changed, as we all know. You just mentioned that we have a... a Talent blindness. Once you have a talent, once you have the information, the CV of somebody that could be something, if you investigate further and interview further, follow up on it. Don't let it like sit next week. Times have changed. You have to be on top of this applicant like a bee or honey. Mm. Because there are companies right now that are behind this company. Talents or professions have options today. So if you still think of the recruiting department, like, you know, before the pandemic, ah, he's going to be there still in two weeks. No, he's not. He's not going to be there in two weeks. I have, and recently, in the recent months, I had so many companies and I pushed them, please tell me your feedback. Would you like to interview this and that? Uh, just recently, again, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, uh, let me take a look at that CV you sent me two weeks ago. What? I sent it, in, and then, oh, I really would like to talk to her. I call her up, no, she's gone already. She got another offer. She committed so many times, you know? And, uh, uh, yeah, you have to follow up on, on, on these things, really, really. And uh, things, things have changed. If you have somebody that looks promising, you're not sure yet, follow up until you know if he, if he or she could be something or not. And then you, then you, you know, but just follow up. And the other thing is very funny. I think we mentioned it uh, uh, the other day is if you see a CV that doesn't look really professional, you know, it's like, you know, not written or, or the interview, he's not very, ex- ex- he's not very talkative. These people are not trained in looking for jobs. These are good people or could be good people. You know, when I get this perfectly written CV with the colors and everything, and la, 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 you know, I'm like, mm, you know, this person has been trained or trained himself on applying for jobs, right? And then I get the CV. It doesn't even have a picture. It doesn't have the web page of previous companies. Uh, but somehow I, as a trained eye, see something there. I want to talk to that person. The person has been working with companies, uh, the last companies, four years, the previous one, six years. I want that person. I want to know if, if he's something for the opening I have or not. But this person is not trained on a, he mm. never had to, he never had to apply for a job. They, 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 they searched him. They took him out, uh, you know, of the job and they offered him something. He never had to apply for a job. So he doesn't know how it works. And that's the person I want, because today, loyalty or work, work stability 
is one of the most important criteria mm -hmm. we look for as recruiters. People that don't uh, get spooked because, you know, of some difficult situation. You want people that really know to adjust, that can uh, adjust to a company, that are committed, you know, and that, are, that, are, that are, uh, once they decide to join the company, they really want to make it work. So mm. uh, work, uh, work uh, stability in these times is really, really important. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. But we also shouldn't forget about those ones, especially when they are young, right? Because yeah. when they're young, they start to, they, they are still in the discovery phase. I always think about them as, as like in the discovery phase. And what did you learn about yourself in the past six months? You had like seven different jobs, you know? Um, yeah. But um, obviously, as you progress with your career, and that shows, you know, when you spend when you spend time with your with with, with one company or with one workplace, um, it shows not only loyalty and dedication, but then you can adjust because yeah. things must have changed millions of times during that time, right? You can adjust right. to different managers, different leaders, different direction, different visions, and that's that's a great skill to have. On the yeah. other hand. I also feel, and I don't know how you see it as from the recruiter point of view, because I just left my company so after 17 years and I love that company so, so much. And I literally, you know, I'm the greatest fan of that company. I always, you know, talk highly about it. But um, I also feel that I missed out. I missed out on seeing thing, other things. I missed out on seeing on another industry. I missed out on seeing another maybe hotel company because all I know how is how things work here. And I don't know anything. I mean, I learned a lot in the past 17 years. You know, I've done everything, moved countries and continent, and I could do whatever I wanted to do. At the same time, I don't know why. I feel that I, it was a mistake. No, of course not. Of course, that was a mistake. I tell you one thing: hotel managers could be successful in so many different industries, mm. but different industries cannot be successful in the hotel business because mm. the way we, the way we make our career, the way we have to adjust, the way we change countries, the way we change positions, the way we work with different uh, cultures and different uh, environments. I mean, I've seen so many hotel managers which changed to other industries, and they were very successful because somehow we as uh, hotel, develop, uh, hotel managers, we develop skills. We are, we are very, very flexible, and we just have to drive to succeed. As a, I mean, you cannot put a doctor as a general manager. You will never train a doctor as a general manager, right? But I believe a, a hotel manager can be a great manager, for like DH, DHL or some, some other company, production company, uh, a production plan, they can be great managers, you know? So I don't think you missed out on something because whatever you do today, whatever you are now, you are because of your 17 years with the company. Mm. That's what you do right now. If you wouldn't have these 17, that's my opinion. If you wouldn't have these 17 years with the company, you wouldn't be doing your job currently as good as you do it. Probably, probably. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But since we are talking about cross industry recruitment or going to another, do you see that often happening? Are they looking for hospitality people? Because I found it very, very difficult in the year not, during the past years. Not really, I, 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 unless you have some kind of a personal collection. You know, I had a couple of uh, 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 friends, candidates that worked for years, very successful in the hotel industry. And then because of a personal connection, because of friendship or business relationship, they pull them out of the hotel and they put them into their business. Mm. I mean, because they're so the talent and the skills they have, you know, they might, they might not have the technical abilities, but they have the attitude, the personality to make it work, you know? Mm. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, you know, but like applying like cold, to uh, another industry will be a bit difficult, you know, yeah. but but once you, uh, uh, if you work as an owner or a manager or director in a different industry and you get to know a couple of people from the hotel industry, 
Mm. They, 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 they call, they call their attention. And it happens sometimes that they put them away from the hotel industry. Obviously, some people, high manage, uh, or managers in the hotel industry, they are afraid to leave this nice, beautiful bubble. You know, the yearly home flights, the, the, the rent they get paid, and, you know, the schools for the children. Obviously, in other companies, that doesn't really happen. Mm. So uh, you, have to go, you have to be at a certain point to make the decision, you know. And we in the hotel industry, we have uh, we, we have dates that, uh, how do you call it, we, uh, there are dates in our professional lives. You know, once you're over 50, it's really tough to, to, to keep up with yeah. what the hotel industry demands because there's somebody like you 20 years ago that works double for half the money, maybe doesn't have as much of experience, but today the owners, they, are, they have a different thinking. Also, you know that. And I know that. And I know that. And um, I think it was very visible during COVID. I mean, COVID was a very different game. But after coming back, COVID, I mean, it's always been in the industry. But after coming back, uh, after COVID, I noticed that we don't want quality. What we want is cheap workforce from top to bottom, you know? And this is why we are also, in the past few weeks, I've been talking about, you know, the reputation of our wonderful industry. And it's kind of being damaged and people, we, 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 we are struggling to attract talent, um, you know, the applications and all that kind of, even the number of applications I just, I just done. And, um, and it's because we lost quality leaders. We lost quality professionals and whoever are running the hotels today are, you know, not up to par and they are ru- ruining the, the, the workforce, the, the experience of the workforce and they leave. So yeah. we put ourselves into this vicious cycle that I don't know how we are going to be able to break because, you know, we need experienced people to run the show. Yeah. So, Sylvia, <laughs> if, if, you know, the, uh, the cost of rotation of losing an employee and hiring a new one, it's an invisible cost. Nobody sees it. So nobody feels it. You know, it doesn't hurt. You know, because it's not part of the, of the budget, right? Of the expenses. But if you, and you can, put into numbers, real numbers, how much it is to hire somebody new, having work, having worked two, three months, four months, and losing them again, and hire somebody else. If you would put this on the budget line, things would certainly change, and you would make a much bigger effort of hiring the right person and keeping him in the company. Right? I agree. No, I that, agree. but but this is an invisible cost. They don't know. You know, I, I don't have to respond to this in the budget meeting because it's not there. You know, that the food cost, the beverage cost, labor cost, daka, 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 but they don't see, they haven't, they haven't a ratio of, 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 of turnover, but they don't know how, how much it costs. You know, the, the airplane, the ticket for the family, blah, blah, you know. So that's one of the reasons, you know. But things will change very soon because of something that you mentioned a few minutes ago. The younger workforce, the younger people, that are 25, 28, 30 years, they have a completely different attitude than you and me. For us as a recruiter, it's a huge challenge. You know, mm. these guys grew up not looking for social contact out on the street or on a party or on a bar. The, where they look for their, for, their, for their contacts is on the cell phone. That's, that's like another organ for them. So they have different values. They never needed anything. They, have ne- they never had any necessities, right? Mm. So this is very hard for a recruiter and the company to add loyalty for them. It's like, ha, loyalty. I get tomorrow, I go tomorrow, I don't work for two months, I live with a friend, I'm fine, you know? Mm. So this, uh, and then hopefully, and I believe it will, people or companies will go back to, uh, to values of the little older generation that grew up differently, that have different values, you know, uh, because uh, they're just, companies get tired 
of this, you know, of this attitude. Not really, it's not really important to me the job. You know, they, they will get uh, tired. Yeah. And I hopefully, and I believe it has to because uh, you cannot run the, the the longer it takes and the older the, this generation gets, the more they move into middle management and higher management positions, right? And the ones who will do it successfully will be very few. So you have to maybe go back on these people that, you know, that are 40, 50 years, that grew up differently with different values, you know. So, but let's see what happens there. But the younger workforce is a huge challenge for everybody involved, for everybody. I think the younger workforce is a challenge because we haven't learned their language. We don't know how to speak to them. We don't know how to manage them. We don't know anything about them. And, and because... We, don't, we are not even open to, to learn about them. And they are very bad in communicating what they, yeah. what they need, you know. Um, they just go. Because this is what we taught them in the past two decades, you know. Um, yeah. You know, you can quit any time that you want. And this is the narrative. Like, you don't need to suffer. You open LinkedIn and TikTok and everywhere. Oh, I'm keeping the, oh, giving up my job. I, I'm leaving the corporate industry. And millions of videos like that. So they are already been trained to leave the industry, which is, okay, yeah. leave the corporate world. I'm not saying not to or stay, but at the same time, uh, nobody is talking to them about, okay, you know, what's the alternative? If once yeah. you come into the workforce, well, how do you yeah. want to be treated? And we need to have more of these conversations because we're really leaving their talent on the table or in this case, out the door. Because... Yeah. I truly believe they are very, very talented. We just don't know they what are. to do with their talent. Exactly. That's what you just said. I don't want to bash the younger girl. Of course not. They're very talented. But you just have to approach them differently. You know what I mean? For them, they have other priorities in life than making money. Most <laughs> of them. I'm talking about middle management, you know? Uh, uh, so the old way of onboarding is not working anymore. So you have to rethink and go on their way of thinking to, to, to get to them, to, to access them, to, to motivate them. Today, like, you know, you don't find greatest chefs on LinkedIn, young mm. kids, chef de cuisine, sous chefs, where you find them is on Instagram. LinkedIn, they, they don't care about LinkedIn, too boring, too adult, too conservative. So I don't find these uh, young guys like these, these molecular chefs and, uh, and the, 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 the creative ones, I don't find them on LinkedIn. Mm. They, have a, they have a profile maybe on LinkedIn that haven't been touched for a year. But where you find them is on Instagram, for example, right? So, uh, and then other, other, other positions you do find more on Twitter than on LinkedIn. So it's, you know, you have to really kind of like think how they think and look where, where they are. Uh, and not like just like trust any source that you have, no. And then, uh, for example, a very creative sous chef, a chef de cuisine, you know, they, 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 it's very important to them. I just had an, uh, what's so funny, I had a uh, client in Vietnam, very well known hotel, hotel brand, you know, and uh, very well known, very luxury, everything. They wanted to have a, uh, a Michelin, Michelin experienced chef which I found in, uh, in the U.S., French guy. And uh, uh, in the interview process, they couldn't transmit to him. He was looking for creativity. He was looking for a challenge. He was looking for what he is good at. And they just told him, uh, yeah, we want a Michelin chef, but you're going to be taking care of the banquet and the coffee shop. That doesn't work. <laughs> you know, that, that just doesn't work. You know, if you ask me of Michelin chef, I will get you, Michelin chef, you know, but then see what he's looking for. And if you don't, if, if you don't, if you cannot offer this to him professionally, it's not going to work. So, you know, it's like, you know, it was a great example. This guy obviously didn't take the job. He was very interested in going to Southeast Asia, a great resume Michelin, but an auto, they didn't even have a coffee shop there, but I just expressed themselves completely. Uh, inadequate, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think it would have been a good match for them and for him, but they mm -hmm. just couldn't, ex they didn't understood or didn't understand what he was looking for and they couldn't, they couldn't communicate to him well enough according to his 
objectives what they have. So it didn't work. You know, this is your understanding you you are your 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 candidate, you know? Yeah, very important. Especially with chefs, they are so creative and they need that, that creative outlet and freedom. Leave them alone, you know, don't try to tell them. This is sometimes what I see, you know, in hotels, you have a fantastic creative chef. And then the GM or the CEO or whoever, you know, everybody comes and put their two cents. Oh, I think you should cook that. Really? Uh, you hire some... Yeah, because they have personal taste. That's so, that happens so Nobody's much. Nobody's interested in your personal taste. Like, leave the guy alone. No, he's not telling you how to run the company or the hotel. So you shouldn't be telling him what to cook. He's the professional. So Yeah, well, yeah. yeah if they say, oh, I don't like that. But the other can do, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's not your taste and it's not what you, what, what you personally like, but it's selling. So leave it alone, you know? You know why? And I had this conversation once with somebody and this is so unfair to other fantastic chefs. Okay. Because who should be judging your cooking really? Other yeah. fantastic chefs. It's not that the hotel management team, the HODs come together, have no idea about how food should be, about presentation, about the cooking techniques. There maybe is a very difficult technique that that the skilled chef use, so you should appreciate that. All they do is go for a nice lunch. Oh, yeah, it's nice. Hire the chef. Yeah. It's, it's the worst thing I ever seen. It's an insult to a creative chef that the HOD team and the VP and the CEO and CEO and whoever, oh, judging their cooking. No, it's another panel of fantastic chefs who should be judging their cooking because they know what it takes to cook that plate of dish. You, so. know, Sylvia, you as a recruiter, you're in the middle. You hear so many horror stories from candidates. They can express to you what they experienced. You know, they can, they can never say that in the hotel. Things like, you know, chef, please put the red snap on the menu because the GM's wife likes it. I know. You know what I mean? GM's wife likes it. What? Why do you want to take away a dish from the menu that should be for the public? I mean, we, we all know it happens a lot of times, you know? So, you know. I know. I know. So, and one last question before we, we wrap it up. This talent, blindness kind of thing. Do you think that LinkedIn should be start, should be used um, instead of CVs? And here I'm saying not LinkedIn as some people are using it, but LinkedIn should be the platform where we put our thoughts, our work, how we see the world, what we have created, whatever it is, right? In case of chef or the dishes should be in there, right? In, in terms of talent development, learning and development, how I view learning and development, my field. HR, about labor laws, about practices, modern, et cetera, et cetera and so on and so on and so on. Because I think we're missing out on seeing this side of people because the CV should be put in the the rubbish bin of the past. I can't stand CVs. What we should be looking at, and this is when we should, we could identify and see more of the talent. What do you work? What is your thought process? How do you view the world? What is your emotions and reactions to certain topics? What have you actually done? And I think this would be such a great way of looking at talent. Well, I think, you know, your LinkedIn profile definitely should be like you know should be on top and should be well done and uh, with the most important things. Today, people that I mean LinkedIn is LinkedIn is a professional network. You have a profile there because you want to connect mm. either to do do to get hired or to hire or to make any other connections, you know. And if you put a lot of stuff in there. We live today, we live in the real world. We don't have, we have a very short attention span. You know, especially, uh, you know, if you, if you look for a certain position, you're mm. going to profiles and profiles and profiles. You look for the important stuff. So if you really write like a book on LinkedIn, it will not be read. I tell mm. you honestly, because people don't have the patience to go through your profile and spend that much time on it. Mm. You know, that's just my opinion. You ask me yeah. for my opinion, that's what yeah. it is. 
Yeah. And plus, the, the, the other important part is how many LinkedIn profiles are there which are not really updated? Oh, you yes. Know? Oh, yes. They're not updated. So uh, you see a profile, that's just one of the things. And he's been, he's working since, I don't know, 2020 in this company. Oh, all right. You couldn't be, and then you get, uh, you get them on the phone, you get a commitment. No, I left the company in 221. Oh, okay. Now we have 223. That changes the whole idea. What has he done since then? Well, I, I worked there and I worked there, but, but put it on your LinkedIn then. You know what I mean? So that's, I know how you think about a CV, but when I get it, when I ask for a CV, I want commitment. Give me something that just came from you and that is updated. Mm. So I know what you're up to, you know, yeah. in LinkedIn, they don't have to commit too much. They put in there basically whatever they want to, want to put in because a lot of people see that. But once I ask for personal information at that time and I emphasize your updated CV, I want to get familiarized with your professional profile, then they're committed and mm. they have to put something in there because I see CV and I research and look at this and that, you know. So that's why, uh, yes, you should have definitely a, uh, like I say, a kick-ass LinkedIn profile, being authentic. Mm. But don't put put the essential part in there. Don't write a book there because nobody will read it. Mm. It's the simplest. You know, I, I mean... Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's a difficult one. But I think, you know why it would help if people... And I'm not, I'm not saying that, you know, those people who just share other people's content. Sometimes for me, if I need to look for, especially senior leaders, right? I would look at your LinkedIn profile, but this is just how my brain works. I would look at your LinkedIn profile. And, and if you can only share other people's content, my question would be, okay, so have you not produced anything? Do you not have a thought on your own? Do you not have an opinion about something? Because I maybe don't want to have people in my senior leadership role who, who who don't have a you know opinion or a point of view or have not added anything to the industry in terms of contributing now it doesn't mean that they can't do the job that's not what i'm saying but at the same time it would also help those who are really bad and you know that better than i do probably who are really bad at selling themselves during an interview because there they could showcase this is who I am, this is how I think, and this is what I do. And But they don't like to talk about it, or they are very bad at talking about selling themselves. And you can also weed out those who are fantastic in interviews. They are fantastic selling themselves on the CV and everything. But on LinkedIn, what have you done, lovely? You're just sharing someone else's content. You haven't done anything. Yeah. So we could look at people, yeah. you know, in very different ways. You know, there are only like 20, 20, 25 percent of the profiles on LinkedIn are active on LinkedIn. You know what I mean? The other ones like are, are like in a, in, a, in a hibernation. Once they need a job, then they start putting up their, their LinkedIn profile and all these things. But uh, you know, Correct. so uh, difficult, difficult. You you have to have uh, once they are on LinkedIn, you have to have a trained eye to recognize could this be somebody or not. If it could be somebody, pursue him, contact him, make follow-up, contact him again. There's a beautiful uh, functional LinkedIn that says when you send him a message or a mail, like, uh, uh, remind me, no, in two, three days, again. And if it's really a profile that I want to talk to him, then you go through a secondary contact of him. Listen, introduce me to him. This is all work. You know what I mean? Mm. And then you get to the point where you say he could be something or he could not be something, mm -hmm. you know? But that's that's what a good recruiter does, and it takes a lot of time, effort, and and uh, uh, you know, and, and persuasion, you know. So yeah, uh, yeah. But a LinkedIn profile, yes, you should always have a great LinkedIn profile, but don't write too much. It's just like with a CV. If the CV doesn't capture your attention in the first ten seconds, you know, I mean, you HR directors they read their CV ten seconds, oh, and then they read more, or they go ten seconds now. Nah. You know, there's the first 10, 15 seconds. That's really mm. important. Yeah. And I think that's a good note to uh, finish that 
looking for a scene talent, it takes time. And yeah. in the hotel industry, we don't have the time. We don't have the luxury. We don't have the money. We don't have anything. So rely on outsourced recruiter because at least they can put the time in to find the yeah. talent. Otherwise, the talent shortage is caused by us, by our talent blindness. And, and, and contrary, it doesn't cost you anything unless you hire somebody. He works for free. You know, so there's no risk involved. Mm. Most of the recruiters, they, they, you know, they, are, they get re remunerated based on results. You know, so, yeah. you know, I had them. Yeah. You know. Well, Heiner, thank you so, so much. That was very useful. And um, thank you for waking up so early in Mexico. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm always up early. Thank you. I'm older, you know, so I wake up early. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, podcast and uh, talk to you soon in the future, okay? Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.